Yes, but hey, who wants a pot of coffee? I just make coffee. You want a cup of coffee? Sure, there you go. Who wants coffee? Anybody else want coffee? Who wants coffee? And now, it's time for the man with the caffeine. The new tropics for the brain. It's Coffee with Mike. Hang in, hang tight, grab your cup, and let's get this thing started. Hey everybody, welcome back to Coffee with Mike Java Chat. Sitting here with, oops, going this way. I have to remember, I'm in, I'm in reverse mode here with a Yaro Starik here from uh, Inbox Done. Uh, thanks for hanging out, man. I appreciate you stopping in today. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Mike. I, I, I love doing podcasts, so let's, <laughs> uh, let's dive in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, it's your first time here, so we always ask our guests to kind of give us some background. Where are you from? What do you do? And all that kind of stuff. So why don't you give us a little, lay it out for us, man. Yeah. Uh, so the, the short version, born and raised in Brisbane, Australia, uh, Canadian parents who are actually immigrants to Canada from Eastern Europe. Um, but, you know, pretty much lived in Australia, despite having a Canadian accent, as you, you might hear as this interview goes through, um, <laughs> got my start in uh, business or entrepreneurship, basically because of good timing. I was 18 and I was going to university for the first time and the dot-com bubble was happening. It was 19. Oh boy. I remember that one. Yeah, that was a fun time. And it's, yes, it was. you know, as you can imagine being 18 and, and I was already you know, wanting something that wasn't a job, seeing all these people do crazy stuff online just gravitated me towards the internet. Yeah. Not, not that I knew what to do, um, <laughs> but it certainly gave me a, a chance to sort of play. Uh, and if it wasn't for the university giving me like a dial-up internet account, I would not have had access. So that was huge. Hey. Um, started a card game website uh, about uh, Magic the Gathering, which some of your more card game playing audience might have heard of. It's still going today, a very popular Oh, yeah. Game. It's definitely still going. Yeah. Okay. You, you obviously know it, Mike. So, um, and it was, you know, a hobby for me when I was 16, 17 in, in high school. And I played actually a little bit competitively on the, on the, the pro tour a little bit. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah. Represented Australia. And then, you know, it was a hobby website initially. I just talked about the card game. I had other people write some uh, tournament reports, how they did at tournaments. Then I dived in and started a little e-commerce store. So that's really when it became like a proper a business, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still a side hustle. Um, I made, you know, $500 a month here and there selling my collection. Um, kept going with that, but I kind of lost interest in the game around midway through university and that's actually when I started another a company called uh, Better Edit. It was an essay editing and thesis editing service for academic writers. Wow. Um, yeah, that was that was a good little <coughs> business. I, I continued with it after graduating and it became like a full-time income. I was really trying to create like what you call today like a digital nomad business, something sure. I could travel with. Um, sure. You know, I go to places like Hawaii, like we were talking about beforehand, uh, and just make an income, but not really be trapped to either a job or even trapped to a business that, you know, can suck 10 hours a day of your time right. as well. So, um, and then around the time when I was sort of halfway through growing that business, someone said, you should start a blog. Um, did not know what a blog was. Uh, Googled it and it looked like a website, so I still didn't get it. I ended up installing a blog on my uh, editing website, tried to write about the subject of editing and attract that customer base. Boring, very boring subject. So I struggled with <laughs> so, that. So how do you, how do you, <laughs> that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I tried. I mean, I thought my marketing hat on, I'll write articles to attract our target customer, but it was just hard to do. I yeah. was much more interested in writing about entrepreneurship and what it's like to run these two businesses that I had at the time. So I ended up starting entrepreneurs-journey.com. Uh, there you go. A blog about entrepreneurship. Um, again, you can even tell by the way I, I named that site. It was kind of an experiment, a hobby. I really didn't think it through. Um, but I then started writing about entrepreneurship. This is around 2005 when blogging was I was going to say, around that time in 05, though, that was still kind of, people were still kind of just just settling into the idea of blogging. Brand new, yeah. It was yeah, the start was of social media, really. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think Facebook Facebook had only been around for about three years at that point. MySpace um, was huge still. I don't think we even had it where I was. In Australia, we didn't have it. I think it was still That's universities. Right. That's so, true. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha. It was very early days. Um, but yeah, it was, it was the first time you could leave a comment on a post and then write back and, you know, interact with each other that way. So, 
uh, it was fun. But what really surprised me was how I grew an audience. Like I didn't see that coming, um, kept writing, told stories from running these businesses. And then around about two years later, around 2007, I decided to kind of sell everything. Uh, by then I already sold the card game business. Then I sold the essay editing company. I went all in as a, a blog writer, a podcaster as well. And I started creating my first ever course that was of my own creation, which was also nice. daunting. As you can imagine, when you've never been a teacher and educator, the first time you create something that's of your own creation and try to sell it, you're like, this is a big point of validation for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it was it was a success. I had 400 students the first time I launched it. Uh, probably the first how to make money blogging course that was I, I ever know of, 2007. No one else had one out there. Now, of course, you know, there's a course on sure. everything, many, many. Sure. Um, I mean, this, the story keeps going, but I basically spent 10 years creating courses, eBooks, uh, running an online education business with me as the main teacher, built a small team around me. Um, and then in the sort of last five years, I still have the coaching business, but I kind of, um, put it on, I guess, not, not growth mode. I stopped putting time and energy into growing it because I wanted to focus on the company you introduced me as the, the co-founder of inboxdone.com. So we do email management for people. And I've basically been doing that with my co-founder, Claire, for about the last four years as our, our main project. Um, a few other things along the way, angel investing, I ended up traveling to Ukraine and, and built a, a solar farm, but that's, that's kind of all of it nice. in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, and how did you and Claire meet? So uh, she actually was, I can't remember the year, but she came on board as a, a team member uh, managing my email for my coaching business. So she spent a good few years in that role. Um, she was very hungry, like one of the, like she showed leadership quality. She showed motivation to improve my company, improve her position in it. And then uh, I said to her, you know, I've had this idea for a long time. Uh, I've had people like yourself manage my email. Um, it's been probably the best thing I could ever do for my own productivity, my own sanity, uh, time freedom, all the things I value the most. Surely there's some other entrepreneurs that need this. I just never, and that was an idea from like 15 years ago. I never <clears throat> executed it. And I finally said to her, listen, let's try this. Um, we'll do it as a 50-50 partnership. You will be the first uh, inbox manager who services our clients. I'll try and get us a couple of test clients from my audience. If it works, we keep going. If it doesn't, it's an experiment, you know, we stop. Um, ended up getting two clients. Uh, amazingly enough, one of them is still with us, like almost four and a half years. And the other one lasted almost four years. And uh, from there, you know, we realized, okay, there's a business here. And uh, we kept growing it, you know, built the website, kept uh, going. We got a team of 30 now. So it's it's a nice little company. I, th I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think people understand as far as business owners and entrepreneurs are concerned, how much weight the email actually is. Um, and I think, I think they, they don't, it's just simply because they don't see it. This is the first thing we do in the morning is we're either on our phone tablets or our computer going through the emails looking for, okay, I don't need to read that. I don't need to read that. I mean, even for myself, I only now, <laughs> only now, I only now work through maybe three email addresses a day. Okay. I got eight. The oh, other, wow. yeah, the other five, I just, I, I'll look at once a week, but there, but there's three that I look at daily. Um, thankfully I've gotten most of the subscription emails out so that I don't have to deal with them anymore. But, um, cause I used to like to watch everybody's email marketing. I mm -hmm. wanted to see what they were putting out in content. What was their flow? What was their, you know, what paths were they using and, um, I used to have Ryan Dice come in into my inbox all the time, and I used to love watching but his. He sends a lot of emails, doesn't he? He sends a ton of emails. <laughs> yeah. Mind you, a lot of them are, are actually good, solid content. After I learned his ladder, I was like, okay, I already see what he's doing. So I, I excused myself from that list. It's not that it's junk. It's we have so much to pay attention to mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs and as marketers to understand, one, what our market's actually doing, what our niches are actually doing, and then still trying to have to figure out what our, our customers are doing. And if you're stuck in your email, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so it's I amazing. Can, I, can um, I was just going to say, it's amazing how many people use their inboxes like their to-do list. You know, whatever is there 
is how they drive their day. That's responsive and, though. That's not proactive. Exactly. It is very yeah. rarely the most important task in there. It's very reactive. So it's, it's a habit you have to break. <laughs> that and that and texts. <laughs> yeah. Texts and social media. That's pretty much, I think the, the three biggest things, right? Well, and, and then, and it, and it does, it ends up conditioning. It ends up conditioning people to be responsive versus being proactive. You spend yeah. less time. It, it's the old adage, spending less time working on your business rather than in it is the, is the, is the goal, but so many often end up doing the opposite. Yeah, it, yeah. It, we had, it, um, so I was just gonna say, we have, uh, I just recently interviewed one of our customers and she's an accountant. And she was one of those people, when you get a notification in your phone, she would just drop everything, go and deal with whatever that was. And consequently, everyone who emailed her thought she was amazing because she would get back to them in five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. right? But through her, throughout her entire day, she's constantly interrupting anything she's doing. Uh, so. You know, we, we stepped in and brought her to inbox managers and, and, and had to break her from that habit of responding to notifications. And she had this great way of describing it. She says, I, I, you rescued my mornings. You know, <laughs> she now doesn't have to do that. She's actually creating a course with that extra time. So uh, it's a shift though. It's not like I went through it myself. I was kind of like the first customer and I, I didn't know whether someone else could do my email or, you know, would I be making a mistake? That trust someone? factor is wrong. Yeah, rough. it's a big deal. That trust so. That, that and the, all of a sudden, what do I do with myself now? Well, yeah, that's an existential question. You, you lose your identity in, in your emails. You can't. I mean, if yeah. you're living because of that, you, you literally have, you know, in the mornings, I used to do that a lot. And then I started looking around and going, I have no time to myself. I have no time to read, reflect, chill, have a cup of coffee with a friend. Yeah. You know, it, it's time with family. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, Thankfully, it's my family is here with me, so it's just me and my son. But even that, you know, if I'm in the, if I'm in an evening and he's he's doing his thing and I'm doing my thing, if I'm stuck in emails, texts, or phone calls, he comes walking out and wants to do something. It's like, Ugh. yeah. So that obviously that had to shift. This is a great sounding solution. I mean, how 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 does that how does that work? I mean, does besides very well, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, very well when you carefully manage the handover process, you know, it's, it's, it's something, um, as I said, I went through it, it took me about a month to first educate my person who was taking over, she was actually a work at home mom. And so I showed her, so showed her my email, showed her how I respond typically, and then tried to give her the sense of the bigger picture, like, why does it matter the way we respond to an email? what you're trying to achieve, what's the why behind what you're doing. And then three weeks, four weeks later, that's when I felt like, okay, you know, I've seen her reply to some messages. She's adapted. She's learned. She sort of used me as a template to start with. She's built templates from my own uh, way of replying. Uh, and then, you know, you, you hit month three, month four, and suddenly they're doing a better job than you did because it's their job to do that. You know, they're in there every day, they're responding, they're hitting all these situations. So we kind of took that. And then with my kind of my education business, we had three inbox managers at one point. Um, we applied the same system. They were doing like 24 seven support. That's why I had three of them. So when we started inbox done, it was like, we already had this framework. The question was, can we do this to take over an inbox from anyone? Like uh, one's an accountant, one's a real estate agent, another person's a dentist, another's an online marketer, another person's a venture capitalist. You know, these are all different industries. We all have emails. So can you apply this system, this approach to make people, um, you know, to give them the freedom and, and the clarity and the simplicity with that? And uh, it, it was an experiment. I'll be honest, I didn't know whether it would work. Um, thankfully, we're all the same and email is pretty much the same for most people. Thankfully. So thankfully, yeah. So it was a case of, um, refining, you know, we, we've been doing this for four years now and I think we've gotten pretty good at, it. it's actually probably the main thing we bring to the table, our hiring and our training, and then our process for taking over email, um, which I don't think any other virtual assistant companies have focused on as, as much as, you know, we do. No, it's, it's, and this is only because I've worked with a couple of them from what you're describing they're process and premise is slightly different. Um, I don't, I don't know that unless, unless it's a personal VA that you've had the chance to actually sit with, mm -hmm. uh, most VA companies are somewhat, I don't know how to describe it. Um, they're very good at what they do as far as keeping things organized or working through processes, but 
And being reactive, I think that's- Yeah, they're a little more reactive. Thinking like you is a different story. <clears throat> it's, definitely a, it's definitely something that you have to have them real close. So that makes sense, that's cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned angel investing, is that correct? I did, yep, yep, more recent. What kind of stuff do you, do you, do you invest in? So it's been like surprising as well. Like I, long time ago when I was in Australia, I had a friend who actually started a blog around the same time I started a blog. Okay. This was a car blog. Um, we kind of took divergent paths. So I was sort of the personal brand, um, you know, education business. He went, no, I'm going to get investors. Um, I'm going to build like a company and he had a staff of 30 with you no know, writers and so on. And because I was so close to him, it was like, I get to hear, oh, so you're, you know, you're doing this and this is working and this is not working. And there was a couple of opportunities to invest. And I said, no, like two or three times. And I finally said, yes, like on the third time. Um, and that was a long time ago, 10 years later, the company got bought by a, a media company in Australia. Um, wasn't a huge win for me. Like I got three times uh, my return, which I probably would have got if I kept it in that's, the stock market. That's better than a lot of them. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> and thankfully I knew no, nothing about what I was doing. So I just kind of threw in a larger amount than I probably should have as an angel investor. You know, it was a, it was a bigger chunk of my net worth than was safe to do at the time, but I was ignorant and said, I know this guy, I'm pretty confident I'll do it. So it was, it was a good result. Um, then sort of fast forward to like, maybe 2017, um, I always knew about angel investing, but in my mind, I thought you had to put in a hundred grand minimum, 50 grand minimum into every company. And I was like, I'm doing well with my business and how I've, you know, over the years made money, but I would not be able to drop 50 grand per company, um, maybe once or twice. And I'd probably stop, right? Yeah. It would be too much yeah. my net worth. <laughs> so I discovered, um, well, I knew about him, but I, finally read Jason Kalkanis' book. He's a well-known angel investor and podcast host. He hosts yep. This Week in Startups. Um, read his book, Angel. And the biggest takeaway for me in that book was that, no, no, you start with small amounts. You know, you put in 2,000, 4,000, maybe eight, ten thousand 10,000 maximum into an initial investment. And then, you know, you know that's probably not going to go anywhere, but there'll be one in 20 or one in 30 that will go somewhere. And when you get that one in 10 or 20 or 30, you double down or maybe even triple down. So you add more as it raises and continues. So I was like, okay, I, I've, I'd love to devote again, not my entire net worth, but a, a small part of it uh, into angel investing. So I joined his syndicate, which was and has nice. been by far the best um, education I've ever got around angel investing. So, um, and I joined another syndicate by Arlen Hamilton. She's uh, focuses, focuses on underrepresented founders. So, you know, Black, Latino, yeah. uh, LGBTQ, all <laughs> sort of things. So, um, and then there's Angel List as well as another place where you can follow leads and and uh, people who basically run their own syndicates from that platform. So I've done a few like through Tim Ferriss and Brandon Hill on that, that platform. Um, and it's been like, I mean, to answer your question, a lot of it's been picking and choosing already vetted companies companies that come through these syndicates. So it's not my full-time geek. I'm not on the floor, you know, attending events, trying to find the founders yeah. and then yeah. get on their cap table. I'm like, no, I, I, I'm still running my company. That's my main focus. These people like Jason and Arlen, they're doing this as their kind of one of their main roles. So they have great sure. deal flow. They do a lot of the due diligence. Um, and you know, you, you get an email with a, a deal memo with an option to invest in a company and you read it and you go, okay. Um, Take, for example, this company, one of my early investments through Jason, it's called Steezy. It's like Netflix for dance lessons. So nice. you love to learn how to dance. You go to Steezy, you download their app and they, you can learn anything, hip hop, ballet and so forth. So, you know, when they get presented to us as angel investors, it's, they're very small. They, they might be doing 10,000 a month, 20,000 a month. It's a good little startup company, but far from, you know, a big venture backed company yet. And you stop and go, okay, you read the metrics, you read their sort of thesis and what they're planning on doing and where they're going and who's founded it and, you know, the team. And then you just simply ask yourself, do I believe that Netflix for dancing is potentially a company that could make a hundred million a year in revenue, which would make it a billion dollar plus company, which right. is always the ultimate goal as an sure. investor. Sure. So I pretty much have been doing that kind of, you know, uh, trying to guess in some levels. I mean, you get the advantage of these other people already bringing good companies to you, but yeah. you still know that 20 out of 22 will probably fail. Um, the great thing is, and I've now been doing this for about three years, four years. So I've seen enough of them to 
to spot, okay, so this one, for example, there's a company called Lead IQ, and Steezy actually has grown. It's it's doing almost 10 million a year, so it's it's done already really well. nice. Yeah, and, and um, uh, Lead IQ is another company. It's kind of like a lead management tool. You know, typical SaaS platform helps people, uh, helps companies to manage their leads, find leads, you know, get customers. Basically, um, I get that field, but it's so competitive. I would have never have known whether this one was good versus another one. It was actually the first deal I ever did on Jason's platform. So I was kind of very experimental. I was like, you know what? I'll just pick this one. I'll see what it feels like to put a few thousand dollars into it, how the process goes. And then you get, uh, this is the best part. You get deal memo, a uh, deal update. So well, that's not right. You get founder updates. So the founder, every could be every quarter, you know, might be every month, depending on how active they are. They'll write uh, a short email just explaining, this is what we've done. This is how we've grown in revenue. This is what we're looking to hire people for. This is where you might be able to help us as investors. And it's just so fascinating to see behind the scenes of, of this company that then like I've done about 25, maybe 30, I think total investments now across all these platforms. And they're very diverse. You know, one's um, Uber for cat sitters. So if you need a cat, a cat sitter, a person comes to your house and will look after your cat. It's called, called meowtel.com. Um, just had the founder actually on, on my podcast. Uh, then there's, let me think. So I'd, I'd be interested in talking to that person as well, oh, well just because yeah, yeah. that's a cool idea. It really is. And it, it's, it's grown well. Um, it was a bit of a, a challenge through COVID to, to you know, make it through oh, yeah. a period where people sure. don't need cat sitting anymore, but um, yeah, that was fun. And then like, I mean, I, I should give myself some uh, reminders here that when you do this enough times, you actually forget about the companies on your portfolio and i have to go back to my own tab on my website and go well, oh yeah there's uh this one and there's this one so i mean there's some really <laughs> cool stuff that i invested in because i really liked um root ai actually got acquired but it's a robot that picks fruit so apparently there's been a huge labor shortage in yeah there has workers. been yeah so you get a robot and you know it's got a little robot arm it grabs the fruit puts it in the basket it can adjust from a strawberry you know to a banana or an apple or whatever um so to see what else is exciting. I mean, there's some really exciting stuff. A cash systems is one of Arlen's ones. Um, it's satellite technology. So it's basically kind of like what SpaceX is doing with their, you know, um, internet satellite service. Oh, cool. they're, nice. they're part of that. Uh, and it's not specifically SpaceX, but they have a, a cooling technology. And basically because there's no air in space, it's very difficult to cool the, the technology that's floating up in there. So they've got a, like a, artificial diamond based patent that the founder of the company came up with. And they're applying that to keeping the uh, satellite technology cool, which helps with throughput. And um, obviously the goal is to get internet access to everyone on the planet. So it's a pretty ambitious goal as you can that's, imagine. That's so, interesting. That's very yeah. interesting because what little I know of our, our space and atmosphere at certain levels, it's extremely hot, but at certain levels it's like below freezing. So it's, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of odd. It's, like below freezing but then the technology itself is getting so hot and the, because there's no airflow there's no airflow it's just a big vacuum yeah, yeah so there's no way to internally cool something you need to like have the actual substance itself yeah. not get hot so i mean <coughs> I, I it's totally beyond my pay grade in terms of you know the science behind it but don't look at me yeah. i don't this, know enough about that stuff yeah. but I, I think it's cool don't get me wrong i think that's that's great I, somebody's yeah. figuring out how to keep shit alive because you certainly don't want to be on your way to even just the moon and all of a sudden, Hey, we just lost three capacitors that we needed, you know, or yeah. something like that. That's like yeah, the yeah. last thing you want to hear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and you can see the range there, you know, from cat sitting to satellites, it really is What's very that's diverse. <clears throat> <you know? clears throat> that's super of, cool. It is. And that's kind of why, I mean, I'm not putting in huge amounts of money, but if you get one winner, you, you get, you know, potentially a hundred X return if it's really that big. Um, so, 10x return, 20x return is, is not un, unexpected, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, well, actually that's, that's the, that's the target goal. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's again, like, so I used to be a, a manager with an angel group out of orange County. Uh, they had about a 45% success rate. Um, wow. and it was, that's amazing. well, it was highly unusual, but it was because they super vetted everything. And if you didn't have certain elements in your, either your business plan or your operation, between the 185 of them, somebody in the group had a skill that could fit what was missing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And they would insert that person into the operation. So it was no longer just a small cash. It was also a sweat equity that they would end up putting in. Now, again, 45 is huge. In, that, in that never, that's unheard of. That's, it's, it's highly unheard of. They're, yeah. they're no longer together. Um, but even then, like I worked on two of their projects and the CEO that was running both of them, um, he was the sweat equity. He had his cash in it too, but I mean, he actually ran the operation until somebody else could come in and buy it. And then they made their money and they, they, they left. And, and it was anywhere between six to, to eight figure, you know, deals it just depended on what they were looking at. Um, and so it was like an incubator kind of uh, angel investing platform or part incubator, part accelerator. De it depended on what was going on. Okay. For the most part, it was probably more incubator okay. than anything. Um, that, that particular person who's still a good friend of mine's actually built up one of the most successful patrol security companies in California. Um, he had been featured on the news and everything. When he sold, he sold to ADT. Oh, okay. So they, they bought out his patrol deal and then I guess they eventually it all went over to, to digital anyway, but another story for another time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is all cool stuff. I mean, this is, this is amazing. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a shift here. We're going to take a short break guys. We'll be back in about, th about 30 seconds. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what motivates, what gets you going. Like, what are some of the thoughts that roll through your head as you're doing these things? Um, cause they, they matter when, when you're an entrepreneur, you're always looking for other avenues to create income streams. This is obviously a, a, a good one to play in, but you've also got that one out of every 2022 is, is going to possibly be successful. What keeps you motivated? So we'll talk about that when we come back in about 30 seconds. And we're back here, Java chat, hanging out with Yaro Stark, uh, founder and I guess, Managing member or manager or CEO of, of yeah, Inbox Sun? CMO, actually. I'm the marketing guy. Nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we, were, we were being asked. Um, we do some investing, too, and we're actually just now the official first partners meeting last night. Um, they were asking for our titles. And I, I, they're like, well, we need to know what to call you guys. I said, CJM. And they're like, what the hell is that? I said, Chief Java Meister. <laughs> and they said, what does that mean? I said, it means I can do whatever is necessary. It's usually done over a cup of coffee anyway. See, I would have thought Java programming when I first heard that. So most people but, do, but yeah. most, most, most people that know coffee with Mike, it's Java is about coffee anyway. Yeah. Um, interestingly yeah. enough, if you look for Java chat online, um, we show up in the midst of all the programs. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll be surprised. Yeah. We're right in the middle of it. Yeah. And I looked at that and I went, eh, why not? That's, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> I feel like the general population would think it's coffee and then the online population would think. Oh, they would totally, they would totally take it as programming. And I, and I, yeah. and I'm okay with that. And, and here, I think for the most part, it's the fact that we bring guests like yourself that are online, that are marketers, that are entrepreneurs. Um, the programmers like that kind of stuff too. It's, it's kind of interesting to see. Um, and what I enjoy about that, and this is kind of the premise of this section anyway, it's, it's inspiring to know that this content is relevant to all of them. Um, programmers are, are generally the socially awkward uh, people. They're usually quiet introverts that are very analytical and very, very good at what they do. I mean, I couldn't possibly hold a candle to them in, in anything that I've ever done. Um, and yet they're very interested in this kind of stuff because it's just... Mm. To them, it's like, how do you do this? Yeah. How can you how can you talk to people and and not feel like you know, uh, not feel apprehension or anxiety? And I'm like, the, that's part of the whole Java Meister thing is getting over the anxiety is just sitting down and hanging out like two friends, yeah. and and not having an expectation of of one or the other. You know, what you know is what you know. I'll learn it when I get there, uh, or or maybe not. Um, but I'll at least get a better understanding of who you are. And that's how I've always approached any of our deals. And, and I, I must, by the way, you're describing yourself, you're kind of the same. Um, you, you, you have this, you have this, let's see how this works out uh, mentality. Um, and and I, I think, I think more entrepreneurs have that as an almost innate uh, tendency that we're, we, we're kind of like, you know, yeah, there's a good chance that this could tank, mm -hmm. but let's see anyway. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I think that's, I think that's part of the free thinking that I love about entrepreneurship is that it's not that we're not afraid. We're not, it's not that we're not scared. It's that we're willing to, we're willing to look at it for what it is and still take the shot. Yeah. The risk risk profile. That's a, yeah. a big deal. Yeah. yeah my, my co-founder Claire has a much lower risk tolerance um, than I do. So I doubt she would have become an entrepreneur if it wasn't for me saying, you know, do this with me. And even now she's kind of half wishing she still was an employee or, you know, a contractor because she likes the stability or at least the feeling of stability of someone else sort of driving a ship and telling her this is your task. Um, and she's been the CEO really, or m maybe more COO with really managing our team and our hiring. Um, but you can tell like she loves it, but there's always that fear associated in that sort of pull to have a more defined box, which, you know, the, the, the boss doesn't necessarily have. What's always interested me about that as, as far as, as far as how entrepreneurs are, our stability doesn't come from a box. A traditional box it does come from a structure but not a traditional box and that's usually because of the professionals that we surround ourselves with everybody that does all of the services all of the, the our insurance agents our cpas our attorneys and everything those are the guys that create our security mm. versus one person we don't depend on one person to drive the ship we actually have a bunch of different people and help yeah. navigate the ship while we just, you know, make small adjustments here and there. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I never thought of uh, uh, those people creating a structure where we feel safe. But you're right. I do feel comfortable having my webmaster or my designers do that work. And obviously your accountant do the accounting. And, and <clears throat> even Claire, my co-founder, is like she's running and hiring and doing those functions that I don't like. Um and if it wasn't for that, I, yeah, I certainly would feel way more oh, yeah. all over the place. Oh, and I, yeah. I, I'd be like looking to fill those roles all the time. So, yeah. That was one of the, one of the most interesting things that I, I had a conversation with an attorney. Um, it's a friend of mine's and he was like, you do understand what we're for. I said, well, yeah, you're there to defend us. He goes, no, we're there to tell you what your exposures are. Mm -hmm. You still have to figure out what you're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you what I'm worried about. You figure out whether or not you're worried about it. And if you are, do something. If you're not, do something. He's, he's more of an entrepreneurial style attorney. He's not, he's not one of those guys that tries to tell you how to run your company. He just tells you, well, according to this contract, here's what you got to worry about. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's so true. I mean, that's, uh, we've obviously with Inbox done, we have contracts, we have NDAs, <laughs> we have exposure. So, yeah. uh, and, and there is an element of what, do we even tolerate risk there? You know, I mean, every mm -hmm. business has that. I yep. was actually kind of joking because my, my co-founder, Claire, she, we talked a little bit about the potential things we might do in the future after we maybe exit the business. And she's like, I might become a therapist. And I was like, well, you know, therapists are also open to making mistakes and, you know, getting sued. That's why they have insurance. That's why we have insurance. So I was like, I just trying to make the point that nothing is safe, you know, especially yeah. in, in yeah. the current I, world. So. I, I think if more people, I think a lot of people forget whether you're a private citizen or you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter. You're always going to be exposed to something where somebody else may, especially in our, in the U S my gosh, we're like okay. one of the worst when it comes to litigious societies, you could sneeze wrong and all of a sudden you're in court. I mean, yep. it, it's, there's no, there's no longer a thing considered safe or stable or secure I mean, the only place you're really secure is if you go and live in a cave because even in your own house there are problems yeah I you know so it, it's it's but again that's also the excitement that we have as entrepreneurs we we like that kind of stuff it's like well it's it all this is going to sound bad what kind of trouble can we get into today <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I think a part of it is also seeing <coughs> things that we don't like about the world and the yeah. agitation around mm -hmm. that is stronger than the feeling of risk or, you know, the problems we could surface. Like, I mean, I don't like getting, I don't like doing the bookkeeping and accounting side of my business. I don't, I don't do much of it. I have to pass most of that on to the bookkeeper and the accountant. But even when they send me that monthly email, hey, we need this record and this record, I'm like, 
I don't want to do this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you have that already? I thought I yeah. said that last week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I think for the for the for the most part, when we have that structure around, like you said earlier, it it does give us a better feeling of okay, I can go do something else. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Like it kind of needs another another document or hey, did you get the receipt for this? Can I get that to you tomorrow? Can I get that to you at the end of the week? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. I can go do something else. I don't have to worry about that. Um, it's the, it's the, um, what's the word? It's the security and knowing it will be cared for by somebody who can actually care for it. Who wants to and enjoys caring and, for it. And who wants to yeah. and enjoys it. Yeah. Which is always um, a surprise, right? You enjoy doing the bookkeeping and accounting. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's different. Um, yeah. The, the, <laughs> The old, the old adage of the bean counter. Um, and, I, and I have a couple of friends that are CFOs and that's what they live for spreadsheets. I look at them, I'm like, you know, <clears throat> I know how to read them. You pour over them like I've never seen before. <laughs> I'm like, do you find anything? And they're like, oh, yeah, you find stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you got, in, you got in and you became an entrepreneur. What are some of the things that have inspired you to do what you're doing you know there's phases so i feel as an entrepreneur at 18 19 20 21 all the way to 25 26 it was survival um i wanted to be financially separate from you know supporting from parents or from yeah. needing even a part-time or casual job which i did keep for several years never had a full-time job but had some side side jobs so you know that and that's fair enough i think a lot of entrepreneurs will spend almost their entire career unfortunately in that place where they're just trying to make enough to keep their lives going yep. if you can get past that which i did around i feel like 2007 2008 especially by the time i hit 30 like maybe it took a good decade to get there but i had money in the bank i owned the property i lived in i had bought a second one i felt like okay basic needs are met um nothing's gonna fall apart now you know now what what does motivate me you know yeah exactly or even if it does fall apart it's not like the end yeah. of the world we're okay yeah no don't, don't take that casual job back anymore right. so and that was a switch it was then became like all right why am i choosing to do a certain task each day build a certain business what's the focus what's the purpose and for a long time i was just loving the act of sitting in a cafe not with coffee, <laughs> more of a tea drinker, you know, with a brownie or something okay. like that. He's good um, too. And then I would have my laptop out and I would just write a blog post or respond to my community in, in online forums, you know, in my membership site, um, prepare my next product. It could have been a, you know, a new course or write a book. And I started doing that traveling around the world too. And that was such a simple business model. It was me and a few contractors, I was making as much as half a million dollars a year in revenue. Um, I could, you know, it was a digital nomad dream sort of scenario. Yeah, for and, sure. And, and that was enough. Like at that time that that was, and I probably even look back on it. I, I'm not motivated to do that the way I was back then. I don't, I'm not excited about coaching, creating teaching products anymore. But when I was, and that was my daily life, it, it was beautiful. Um, after that though, you know, I still was thinking, well, A, now what? And I think, when you reach a point where you are making a decision to start a business, not just because of financial outcome, it's still there, but it's like, no, I, I want to be doing something each day that I like making a change in people's lives in a way that I'm excited about. Sure. Um, it's funny because <laughs> today with inbox done, um, I come on podcasts like we're doing now and I talk about something which ultimately is kind of dry, like e email, you know, it's not, <laughs> like you know satellites or electric cars or exactly you know really big ideas you know like curing diseases and things like that it's just getting you out of your inbox so you have more time but then i realize and it ties into my own motivation as an entrepreneur i wanted to never have a nine to five i wanted to have no boss i wanted to have uncapped income potential i want to sit down and write a book if i wanted to without worrying about how i was going to pay the bills I want to travel the world. I want to exercise at 2 p.m. in the afternoon 
if I felt like it. So and yeah. cook a meal and, and watch Star Trek for two hours at lunchtime back, you know, in the in the nineties or something like that. So <laughs> yes, exactly. That was the dream. And for that to happen, I needed to learn to delegate. I need to create a business that somewhat runs without me. So email delegation was a big part of that. So fast forward to now, knowing that we help other entrepreneurs to delegate to then do all those things. And maybe those people will free up time from email so they can create world changing, uh, could be physical products, could be software, could be, you know, medical, like we do have some dentists and doctors, you know, doing medical things, or simply put, they may have more time with their family, you know, it could, it could um, heal the world with all the family dramas we all have sort of thing. So there's a lot of intrinsic benefits from the act of freeing people up from email. And I often think of that when I'm you know, doing calls, that's the part that's exciting. Um, it ties into, I guess, my core motivation oh, yeah. that's been there from the beginning as an entrepreneur, which is freedom, uh, freedom and control, those two sides of the same coin, a uh, bit of a dichotomy. And this is a key part of it. So I'm very much motivated by that. But, you know, also now, and this is, I think, the younger Yarrow was the ultimate goal. I didn't want to be defined by one thing. Like, I like knowing that these the angel investments is an option for me and I could have a big win win there plus be part a small part of these very cool things um and as well do other projects with other people so like the solar farm I built in Ukraine was a partnership with the friend I was a silent money partner really but that was something physical something environmental something helping my father's oh, yeah. home birthland <laughs> so I would have never thought to do that but just the way things played out and I like that because it is a part of me that you know, I'm proud of that, that creation as well. So I like lots of plates kind of spinning with the help of other people. And that's the kind of entrepreneur that I've always wanted to be not like defined by I'm just this online coach, or I'm just the co-founder of this business, or I'm just one thing. It's, you know, the mix of all the things that you're doing um, in business. So that's the fun part. I believe that's what motivates me. That's freaking cool. Um, and, and especially the solar farm deal. I mean, solar farms here are, they're expensive as all get out for obvious reasons. I mean, just in Vegas, just, you mean, or in, in no, States? just just in general here in the U.S. I mean, if yeah. I mean, there was a couple of opportunities. I remember that we had reviewed in solar uh, when I was with that other group, group, and they needed a hundred thousand just to get past prototype. Mm -hmm. Now this was this was early stage solar, so you know it wasn't anything like what it is now, where they have graphene now that can actually do the solar, which is insane. <clears throat> but it wasn't as um, it wasn't as exact back then and it wasn't as there was money to be made but it wasn't as lucrative and some of the sales tactics weren't exactly the greatest and they didn't really care for that thankfully mm. uh, now stuff sells itself oh my gosh i mean it just here's here's the data here's what it'll do this is what it's going to save you yeah. here's how it can save the environment here's all of the it's just benny 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 all the way down the line yeah why wouldn't you want to be a part of that yeah plus i think the whole culture mm -hmm. is shifting, you know, as much as yes, Trump was in power and wasn't maybe very pro green energy. Biden is in power now is very pro green energy. And that's going to always go back and forth. I think the general shift is that, you know, millennials and younger are making the choice always. I want the green energy solution. So in interesting, interestingly enough, yeah. um, there, there was a lot of green energy going on even during that administration and previous ones before that we we came across one that was a um, green algae was the catalyst for for the energy um they were also looking for um uh, investment and i think right. theirs was only about 40 or thirty thousand because their prototype was actually done they only needed it for operations and continuing to i guess improve the technology because the technology okay. was insanely large. I mean, it was a, this huge thing with a bunch of tubes that had algae in it. And I can't even remember how it worked. Um, and it was a great idea. I'm not sure if it went anywhere. That was one they passed on. Okay. Um, but there's no shortage of ideas. For oh, my God. Yeah. So Thank, many thanks, ideas. Thankfully. Um, and there, there are a lot of initiatives, even in the midst of every administration that's been around. There have been a lot of initiatives, whether they were for it or not, that still went through. For sure. Again, For sure. thankfully, yeah. uh, I, I, I really try to separate politics away from entrepreneurship because as entrepreneurs, they don't run our lives. They really don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's so um, many um, 
like I, I always find it funny we focus all this media attention on that one figurehead there's ridiculous. so many people doing things under them that you know it's just constantly in action as 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 entrepreneurs i would yeah. think the media would probably be trying to put the positive on everything by saying you know hey yarl has this new tool that can help you actually reclaim your mornings jesus who wouldn't want that here uh, uh tony has this new tony stark sorry first name <laughs> <laughs> Tony has this new thing in solar where you're using graphene now for, for solar Elon, panels. Elon Musk, I think. Elon right. Musk has got this new thing in space travel. Uh, it, it's, yeah. if you, it, I, I, I would think that if more of that kind of focus was actually placed in media, we'd probably have a lot less problems than we do oh, right yeah. now. Um, and, I, and I think a lot more people would be inspired to do more, to think about, because some of the greatest ideas came out of the smallest house or backyard. Some, some guy farting around with a string, you know, came up with some new thing for telecommunications and you're oh, looking yeah. at one, how the hell did that happen? Yeah. It's, but it's, that's how that, that's how that usually goes. Yeah. It's, it's just not, it's not told enough. It's, these stories are not shared enough. Yeah. Um, no, and I, I almost wish we could. And unfortunately the incentives for journalism and media is, you know, we have to survive, we need the clicks, we need the views, which then means we need the sensationalist headline focused it's on the most. One of the reasons why I've stopped watching the news on, on yeah. all sides. I just, if, if I don't, if I don't see, if I see any leaning in either direction, I turn it off. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, and it's now become to a point where it doesn't matter who you're watching, unless it's an actual citizen that's there really digging, like absolutely digging and going, well, you know, you guys know I lean like this, but here's what I found. And I'm like, okay, this is somebody I can watch because now they're calling it for what it is. I, I just won't pay attention anymore yeah. unless I can go research it myself because yeah. it's just not, it's not worth it. That's a fine balance. You know, you, you need investigative journalism to go after potentially the bad things in the world that are happening and, and shine a light on it. But you don't want that to be the only thing and also always focused on a, po a political person saying or doing something like it's almost like we need diversity of media because then we would get, okay, yeah, here's the scientist doing this and here's the doctor doing this and here's the everyday citizen who did this. I always find it funny, you know, at the end of the six o'clock news, they'd always have that one feel good story right at the end, you know, be some everyday person, puppy rescued from, you know, yeah, yeah. swimming in the water and it's like, oh, isn't that nice? But, you know, it, 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 like the whole news should be stories that are kind of empowering and inspiring mixed in with some yes here's investigative journalism about something negative but until they figure out a different way to incentivize i think that's the real challenge i'm not i'm not sure how because you can't the have only, rich people the only give way money. the only way you get viewers is drama there's yeah. there's there's two ways to do it and it takes it, the, the good way which is make them feel good and the bad way which is shake them up Yep. Unfortunately, that draws more viewers than the feel-good stuff. Interesting, you mentioned um, if, if news actually did more of those stories. There is a newscast in Colorado. Um, I'm trying to remember what town it's in, <clears throat> but it's called the Good News Broadcast. Mm, That's incredible. all they broadcast is good news. Nothing bad ever happens in that town. And it's you just know how they're doing? Huh? Do, you, do you know how they're doing? Like, do they have a, a you know, are they surviving as a, as a channel? I wonder, because they're still on, uh, they're, oh, they're still, and it's, it's a local affiliate, obviously it, it's not, they're not just themselves. Um, but it's a small local TV station and that's all it is, is the good news report. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. It's <laughs> boy, would it be great if they could do that all uh, for the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, I, I think if, if we were able to, maybe this is something that, you know, we as entrepreneurs need to just do ourselves and just turn around and go, you know what, enough of the crap news. Let's start putting out some good news. You know, this entrepreneur did this, this entrepreneur did that. And that, that had to, that had to pop up on this. I'm going to get phone calls after this one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I heard that idea you just came up with. No, I didn't come up with it. Um, <laughs> great. Anyway, um, but stuff that inspires, I mean, because stories like, you know, things that have to do with uh, SATCOM, things that have to do with solar, things that have to do with inventions, things that have to do with new patents and things, you know, these are all exciting things. You know, imagine if you didn't, imagine if you didn't have to manage your inbox. Well, guess what? You don't have to, you know, oh, that's a commercial. Not really. Not if you just sit there and explain what it does. Nobody's asking you to buy it. Just, this is cool. Somebody figured out how this is done. Yeah.
in all honesty, that's what press releases are supposed to be for. They say they're supposed to be human interest stories. Eh, maybe. But if you really look at it, wouldn't it be smart to share with the rest of the world these cool things that are coming out? I mean, Inbox Done to me sounds like a human interest story. Yeah. I, I mean, there's certainly stories to share as well. If you take a, you know, a client and their managers, make them real people. Talk Unfortunately, about that, gets, that gets pigeonholed into, oh, that's just a testimonial. Yeah. No, it's a feel good story. Look at what yeah. happened to the business. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, well, well I, thankfully we can control some of that. We make videos. We, yes. you know, can share yes, these stories. And then, and then the internet's so vast. There's always all these little things that's you can the, dive into. That's, so That's the other thing is that the internet has become so vast that even, uh, even the feel good stuff's getting buried. And that's a little concerning to me um, because it's, it's there, again, we have all of this heavy focus on, on what's going on in the world. Not that it's not important, um, but that it's, it's, I think it's over-focused. There's not enough, there's not enough for the rest of it. You know, everybody gets so stuck in, in the muck and mire of what's going on that they forget, Hey, there's a sun outside and it does still mm -hmm. shine. It hasn't blown a solar, it hasn't blown a solar flare at us yet. Um, <laughs> The last one happened quite a while ago, and thankfully we didn't have the EMP blast that it was supposed to give us. We just avoided two, for anybody that doesn't know it. It blew off on the backside of the sun. We missed them both. Mm. Yeah, both of them would have been more than enough to wreck our planet, and we missed it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You're, you're, you're a solo fair watcher. Uh, when it comes up on the news and I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that would have been bad. <laughs> Who are some of the people, real quick, who are some of the people that, um, yeah, this, I uh, told you, rabbit holes, bro. Um, who are some of the people that have, have kind of kept you moving along the way, like inspired you to, to do the things that you're doing? Ooh, um, I mean, macro and micro. I, I am always inspired by my peer group in the sense ah. that um, there's, you know, the entrepreneurs I speak to, you know, maybe it's like once a month or once a quarter, or I just see them online sharing their social media and doing what, seeing what they're doing. So them being hungry and energetic and pushing whatever their message is, you know, that's, that's exciting. And hearing them get results too. I think I'm, sure. I used to be very um, comparison-itis, you know, someone was succeeding, therefore it was my failure, which was a terrible way to think about things. Um, yeah, <laughs> you did that too? <laughs> and then nowadays, um, you know, I, I, I still, there's a still a side of me is a little jealous. Like, Oh, I wish I had that. Or I wish I got, I got that number, but then you're around long enough. You realize there was, there's so many examples as, as people will always be doing better than you and people always doing not as well as you. So you can't ever be happy if you keep looking at that. So I tend to enjoy the friendship side of, and the shared interest of let's talk about entrepreneurship together. Let's, you know, share what's working, what's not working, the, the funny stories behind the scenes. So I enjoy that. And then maybe on the, you know, the, the bigger scale, I do get inspired by um, just, it doesn't have to be like Elon Musk level. I think a lot of us, you know, the Richard Branson's, the Elon Musk, I read their books and I love their stories and the, the, their ability to create world changing entities as companies, which let's be fair, are run by thousands of people. So it's not really mm. the entrepreneur. It's the other yeah. ones who certainly push <clears throat> forward. I, I like more so the leaders in a space. So, you know, I listen to a podcast and I'm into cryptocurrency and I'm like, all right, wow, this person is doing something really cool in that space. Or, um, you know, even with entrepreneurship, with angel investing, you just start to hear, oh, wow, like there's a company called NutriSense that I'm an investor in and they do glucose monitoring software and a dietitian to go with, nice. along with that. So, you know, their whole goal is, doctors are great at basically treating uh, once the problem's there, you know, they're not proactively preventing things. It's like, here's what's wrong with you. Take this treatment. Um, they're like, well, no, we need to manage things before and after that. And that's around monitoring sugar and, and how your body yep. reacts to things and yep. everybody's different and being yep. aware of what you eat. And, you know, I look at that person and I am inspired by them going after such a big problem. Like it's a, you know, how many people in, on, let's just take the USA would benefit from monitoring what they eat and they'd be happier, healthier, they'd be dying later. So, you know, their family won't be losing them. And that's, that's big world changing stuff. So even though you never hear about that person, but you, I'm hearing about them behind the scenes, I'm seeing mm -hmm. their company. So I get inspired by the mm -hmm. entrepreneurs who are, I guess, 
two or three rungs ahead of me, but they're not Elon Musk, which is the big global phenomenon. At the same time, I do love you know, knowing about what they're doing as well, because it shows what a person can create. Wow, a person can create a space rocket ship company. I know, um, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, and, you know, another person, what I especially love, as I mentioned Star Trek earlier, and I know you, you, by your reaction, are a fan as well. The way Star Trek has in, motivated a lot of these people, and not just Star Trek, like Isaac Asimov and his foundation series, you know, motivating yep. Elon Musk to get us onto multi-planetary species, um, or, or, uh, Jeff Bezos, super Trek nerd, you know, a lot of his ideas uh, are around creating things like Alexa was meant to be the voice on the ship. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're trying to do that. And yeah. I love when science fiction sort of drives science fact, um, what we think about and dream about and imagine in fiction then actually becomes something we strive to create in our real world. So I'm still hoping we get a transporter one day so I can go visit family in australia just by jumping in a beam and i'll be there a second later well, i don't know if it's gonna be my time but we all, we already have the, the star trek and star wars you know that there's a lightsaber out there now like a real uh, there is a real I, plasma lightsaber it, the first wow. version of it has been created and it does work okay but i'm not sure what the application is for that besides <laughs> fighting the bad well, guys I, I don't and, know. And, and, and again <laughs> The mere fact of science fiction becoming science fact in any realm, you know, it just depends on what you're looking at. Um, the, the, the old uh, communications devices from Star Trek, that became Nokia's first flip phone. Yeah. I mean, that was, it was so funny because everybody's like, well, what, what about the tricorder? What about, what about this? What about that? I'm like, mm, they're working on those things, believe it or not. It's, it's yeah. interesting. I mean, we have ultrasound. It's kind of a tricorder. It's just a bigger machine. You know, you can see things that you couldn't see before. Yep. It, it's nice to see that that it does inspire thought, but it also shows just exactly how creative humankind can actually be if they really put their heart and mind together. What would this look like? How could this actually become a reality? You know, or for now, let's just draw it and make, you know, movies around it and see what happens. Because, you know, some scientists is going to look at that and go, I bet we can do that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how that comes around. Some engineer or something goes, hey, wait, 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 wait. That's possible. We just got to figure it out. And then later on, we have uh, uh, DSL figured out by some kid in, in Singapore. It was, and it was a math calculation. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a, 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 a <laughs> I'm looking at that going, okay. Now we have speeds that are in the gigabytes as of today. But mind you, that was years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we, when I worked in telecom, we had a, we had a radio that could transfer a gig a second. They're already up to a terabyte. And you're looking at that going, and it's not even microwave. If, if I remember correctly, it's no longer microwave anymore. Now it's some other, uh, some other kind of deal, uh, that they've been working on for years and it's still wireless fiber. It's, it, they, you don't, you don't even need wires anymore. Yeah, that's, 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 sci -fi. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely sci-fi subspace transmission coming in from yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh that's amazing um when you look at when you look at your your day how do you let's just let's let's do it this way how's your day start uh slowly <laughs> i'm a late to bed late to rise kind of person um you know i take some vitamin C first thing in the morning, um, you know, usually take a, <clears throat> don't have it now, but a glass full of green powder, uh, uh, maybe half an hour later, once the vitamin C is gone. The greens are awesome, me. man. They're awesome. Yeah, got to get the nutrients in there first. Yep. Um, typically, like most people, like I will turn on the computer and, and uh, look for, uh, you know, it's almost like a um, endorphin hit. Uh, do we have a new call booked for a potential customer for inbox done yes. or um have i you know I, i'm i'm invested in things so how is cryptocurrency going today how are certain stocks going today you know those kind of quick hits of <laughs> endorphins and um and then it's more like i've got a to-do list so i will obviously look at my calendar as well i've got a podcast with mike you're actually my my first thing today starting at 11 30 so you can see how late i start um and then pretty much I'll run off the to-do list, but it's very like, I, I <clears throat> long time ago when I was studying productivity back with my coaching business, I realized 
some of the concepts we now call mainstream, like the 80-20 rule, um, the theory of constraints with, uh, you know, looking for that one thing you want to uh, improve and expand on 80-20 um, rule, which is find the thing that has the biggest impact. And then I like the idea of sprints as well. I kind of marry those three concepts, sprints being let's just sit down and do a, uh, like a concentrated bit of work for maybe an hour. And then if I do two concentrated hours a day, I actually call that a good day. Or even if I tick off nice. two things on the, on the, on the list, um, so I, I set the goals knowing, obviously now with hindsight, if these things are done each day, it's that iterative process, Kaizen, the Japanese yep. manufacturing principle of yep. uh, constant improvement. Um, on a daily basis, it feels slow, but then you start to look back in, in years ahead and you're like, I'm so glad I went on these podcasts because now this is happening. Or I'm so glad we stuck to the same business idea and didn't switch because now we're here, even though there's many times where I thought it wasn't going anywhere. Um, or I'm so glad I wrote all these articles because now I'm getting all this traffic from Google, it could, you know, simple things like that. So if it's like write one article a day or appear on one podcast a day or whatever it is, that's the kind of daily goal that I'm, I'm setting myself. Um, not complicated. Right. And then there's ec exercise often, uh, whether it's something simple like walking or I still do uh, P90X classes. Nice. Everyone knows those from yes. so, so I remember that. now, Tony Horton. Um, so I still do tend to do one or one of those every now maybe two or three times a week um i play softball uh my girlfriend and her friends have a team nice so yeah it's it's pretty it's always been very like if there's a day where i'm like you know what <clears throat> i've done one thing i'm gonna watch a movie now uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cook a home you know meal at home uh, and then go for a walk and listen to a podcast that's still a good day even if nothing actually happened that you know created something or was produced something in the business and i can say that too knowing i've chosen and learned over time to build these business models that do function and succeed when you're not there every single day looking at them and you know caring for them um, in the past it was a lot of automation like email autoresponders automatically sending emails digital delivery of online courses ebooks um, traffic coming in from your email list and having you know, articles on Google, these things exist without me being there every day. Like I don't need to be posting to my Instagram all day long in order to maintain my audience. Thank God, you know, that would be uh, a rough gig, which a lot of influencers, you know, currently do do. Um, and versus the many today with inbox <coughs> on my team, like we have a team of 30. So we're always working with clients. Um, we're always interacting with potential new clients i show up for discovery calls i show up for podcasts that's my main kind of function as cmo right now um yeah and that's that's a machine you know you're always looking to build a machine and that that's i kind of didn't mention this in my motivation but part of my early motivation was am i capable of building a machine uh, it's very much a digital machine i'm not like you know creating a something in the real world but it's learning how to combine people and technology so that you have something that delivers value that you created, but you're not a main cog in that machine. And that was important to me. Uh, that's awesome. Cool. Guys, we're going to take one more quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about what uh, what's going on, what's next, maybe some of the projects that he's investing in right now. Right? Back in 30. We're back. Java Chat sitting here with Yara Stark. As our last section. We get to chat a little bit about, a little bit more about Inbox Done and a little bit more maybe about some of the things that you're invested in that you're watching. So uh, give us a lowdown. What's Inbox done, like, for real? What is it? Well, I feel like I've already had such an opportunity to talk about Inbox done. So <laughs> I, you, know, you already know it's it. We essentially would give you two people. We call them Inbox managers. So right now, Mike, if you're doing too much email, maybe you're getting caught up scheduling your calendar. Uh, maybe there's some routine admin tasks, whether it's responding to inbox messages in social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn messages. Um, maybe it's just following up emails. So a potential lead comes in, you want to send an email day one, day five, you know, next week, chase them up, you know, dynamically, um, or, or basic other admin tasks you might have, like enter data into some kind of task management software when an email comes in or make sure the webmaster knows to make this update. What we try and do is we step in and remove the founder or the CEO or client from the loop of all these processes. So 
they're not the bottleneck and they're also gaining time by not being the person who has to sit there and type an answer to every question that comes in an right. email, whether it's how do I find this resource or can you fill in this information or do you sell this or are you available <clears> to talk <throat> on this show? You know, all the things that you might deal with. And we assign two people. So the way we work is give you two inbox managers. They become part of your team. You communicate with them directly. Could be through Slack or Microsoft Teams or WhatsApp or a phone call, whatever you prefer to work sure. with your team. Um, they will update you with what you need to know or what you want to know, but they're trying to not create more tasks for you. So if you just want a daily update of what's important or a weekly update, um, as an example, I tend to go into my email once a month in my coaching business. There's a little Yarrow folder, maybe 2% of emails go in there because the 98% Alex, my inbox manager is handling for me. Um, for a lot of people with two inbox managers, we go in and clear your in email twice a day. So you go down to inbox zero twice. Um, two is because we want to make sure that if someone has a holiday or someone gets sick, we don't have to come back to you and say, hey, you need to do your email again. Um, it's horrible, it's like flying first class and then going back to coach, <laughs> having someone else do your email and suddenly you have to do it again, like 100%. It's actually right. a pretty jarring experience. So yeah. <laughs> that's why we give you two to give you that kind of buffer, that redundancy. Um, and then that's it. And, and most of our clients who do stick with us long term, they really grow with their inbox managers. They start throwing more things at them. You know, maybe they introduce them to their online community or maybe more involved with their customer facing you know, management side of things. But our main specialty is certainly the inbox and calendar management. Those two things we do for most people. Um, and we specialize in the hiring process. You know, that's really why you would come to us rather than do this yourself. It's it's uh, we have like a 10 step hiring process. We take only one out of a hundred applicants and um, we get about 25 applicants a day. So like several hundred a month are constantly nice. hitting us, um, which is great, but most of them are just not a good fit. They don't have the level of English attention to detail, you know, the emotional empathy, the availability, um, working well with clients. So we have to train and vet an interview, look at their background, and then we take them through a course. So Claire, my co-founder being the first ever inbox manager, she built a course that teaches people how to manage an inbox, how to work with the client. So they actually go through all of that before they then work with their first client. So, you know, it's the sort of thing you would never have in-house. You wouldn't have all right. the steps for hiring. Mm, right. So we're kind of like an outsourced hiring solution as well. And it starts at 1500 a month. So way more affordable than say hiring an executive assistant on a full-time basis, which is probably going to be, you know, a salary plus benefits kind of situation. So that being said, we often work in tandem with executive assistants too. Sometimes like a, a founder or a, or a CEO will have an executive assistant and then we'll step in and actually take email off the plate of both the executive assistant and the CEO and kind of work with them uh, together because the executive assistants often get lumped with everything. Oh yeah. Of time they, to do it all, yeah. So. Yeah. It's insane what they get lumped up with. Um, you're right. That's crazy. That's freaking awesome. As far as your angel investment side of things, what's, what's your, what's your eye on right now? What are you watching the most? Uh, well, I've basically gone and said no more I'm, <laughs> in the sense, no more new companies, although it's really hard. Like I, I want to, I want to put money in everything. Like that's the way you feel like, cause you're like, this idea is really awesome. Or they've got such great traction or I love this founder. Um, but no, to be absolutely honest, it, it's, you know, I don't want to put, put my entire net worth in angel investing because it's very illiquid. It's yeah. very high risk. So I reached a point where I kind of did 30 and I thought this is a great point to stop. I go back into the ones that are raising their A round or their B round or their C round. Um, there's about five of them that have done that, maybe six of them. So these are the ones that hopefully they'll get to bigger rounds and potentially be acquired or, or float. Um, obviously it's watching what they do too. You know, it's interesting to see, okay, dance classes worked. Oh, okay. Um, glucose monitoring with the dietitian worked. Um, but then, you know, you, you see this one that was kind of like, um, short audio online, a bit like clubhouse kind of thing. And it hasn't really taken off and, oh, there's a cannabis company, but they kind of got crushed by COVID because they ran events as one of their main income streams. So, all right, you know, these ones are not doing so well. Um, I'm, I'm excited about being able to do more. Like if you really fast forward to the future, maybe five, 10 years. Uh, I would love to have maybe exited from some of these companies, exited even from Inbox Done as a, a founder, 
and have a bigger pile of my own angel investing money yeah. so that I can go back in, mm -hmm. you know, get that up to a hundred investments, have more liquid cash to, to double down with bigger amounts with the winners. Um, cause wow, I've seen, it's crazy. Like, um, if I go purely greedy financial hat on and see the potential multiples you can make from this, oh, yeah. like you do the math and there's some people who've got 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 X returns. So you put in $10,000 into a company and suddenly you've got, you know, 10 to a hundred million dollars back. It's like, that's, there's no, I don't know any investment vehicle unless you got into Bitcoin, like from day one, uh, some of these other cryptos from day one, where you would have got you know, that return in that time frame. We're talking, you know, seven to 10 years. So, oh, yeah. um, plus it's very entrepreneurial if you're yes. in any way inclined, uh, interested in that. So I know you've experienced this. You were part of an accelerator. You, you were part of angel investing advising. So um, it's fun. It's just, it's very difficult to do that as your main gig, unless you already have a high net worth. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. you're putting money into very illiquid investments. So it's the, it's the quadrant we all wish to exist in the investor quadrant. It just takes yes. time to get there. It takes time <laughs> to get there. Um, <clears throat> where can people find you? Like, do you still have a blog or are you doing oh, yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. Yeah. Yarrow.blog. Y-A-R-O.blog. That's what that entrepreneurs hyphen journey.com website oh, turned okay. into a few years oh, okay. ago, rebranded it, went, went the personal brand, but um, I have a podcast too called Vested Capital. Um, I have all my content there. My teaching content still there. I list my angel investments there. Uh, my solar uh, plants there. You can see pictures of it. Um, I actually bought a little apartment in Ukraine while I was there for the solar and renovated it. So it's a true blog. I get to right on. All That's the cool. That I enjoy so. Definitely have to go check that out for sure. Yeah. Uh, you on the normal socials like LinkedIn and. Uh, are you on Insta? Are you on in, on Facebook or anything? You have any of those? Yeah, I'm on them all, but they're not like anything more than a place I do drop updates. Um, you know, like here's my latest podcast. Here's our latest article on the Inbox Done. A um, little interacting on Twitter. Um, I will drop this interview when it goes live on all the social channels, you know, those sorts of things. But I'm not, uh, I don't see them as main vehicles because they're just, you know, it's, a, it's I, no. I almost... Most real entrepreneurs don't see I them. I think that's true. Drivers. They're too busy running their business, right? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're the guys. We'll, we'll do like what you just, that's why I did this number. It's like when a new podcast goes up, I'll share it. If for the most part, if you look at my Facebook, I'm only talking about coffee. I mean, <laughs> you really like or, or a good meme. You know, if I see a good meme that I know people are going to crack up at, and some yeah. of them are edgy, but it's not our place, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't mean that as a, it's not our place to be there. It's, it's just not where we hang out you know maybe we yeah. did before but not really i still like twitter like twitter is probably the one i still look to because i find people i want to connect with um, maybe get them on my show um if for some reason because of the small format maybe just because of the way twitter recommends people to me and it's not like facebook and instagram and even to a degree linkedin now you do get way more of like, here's my political opinion. Here's my religious opinion. Yeah. Here's my, my and I just don't want to spend, you know, I don't want to weed my way through that where, where I guess I'm in a nice little bubble a little bit with Twitter. It's like, oh, all these angel investors and, and entrepreneurs doing things that I find interesting. Um, so that's, that's a nice place. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm going to have to probably go back into my Twitter and start shifting up. I usually take our Java chat Twitter and follow all of our guests to see what's going on and try to reshare some of their content because a lot of the people that we have entrepreneurs people that are doing things making moves and, and i love sharing that because a lot of it's good news you know this just happened in the market this is what the result was or here this project is moving and here's a picture of it and you're looking at it going yes you know these, these are the these are some of the things that we we can take as inspiration that there's good stuff happening in this world it's not oh, all yeah. it's not all not at all well, that's, that is awesome, brother. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Remember guys, that's yarrow.blog. All of the links will be down below in the comments. Make sure you go ahead and follow, read, check out his story. I'm, I'm going to go check out the, the solar in Ukraine. I want to see this. This is, sounds cool. Um, make sure that you're, uh, if you're not, there's a subscribe, oops, subscribe button down on that side. Make sure you hit that button. There's a bell next to it. Click that because that tells you when we get another good guest like this. And I don't think we've had a bad guest ever. Nope, we haven't. 
We haven't. Your fingers crossed. That's, that's cool. let's hope it stays that way. Um, we haven't. We've we've never had a bad guest. Everybody's had some kind of great golden nugget, and this one's been froth with them. So make sure you go through this a couple times. Listen to it every time you listen to uh, any of these podcasts or watch it on YouTube. Um, there's something in there for you. If you're listening on any of the platforms that we podcast on, make sure you either subscribe or download there. Uh, drop us a review if you would. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Um, I actually found out I have a hater. I got one hater already, so apparently I've arrived, um, which is great. You know, some people think I have nothing to offer, and that's what well, that's fine. But well, whatever, it's it's not about me anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, the the home base is Anchor.fm. If you are listening to us there, make sure you subscribe and you can show us a little support there as well. We really appreciate the fact that you guys take the time or make the time to come and listen to these podcasts. I, we're trying to share with you good knowledge and and, and good good vibes if you will i like to call them positive vibes um, so take care of yourself stay up stay safe stay healthy and live for myself coffee with mike and for yara Stark. ciao for now for more information on java chat visit www.javachatpodcast.com You've been listening to Coffee with Mike on Java Chat. Tune in weekly to this podcast for the next episode. You can also download or subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform. A production of Oasis Media Group, LLC. Located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.